Welcome back to Conservative Conversations. I am your host, Reed. And I am Frank. Today we're going to be talking about the DNC happening this week, no tax on tips, and more. So let's get started. Before we get started, listeners, I'd like to remind you to please follow us on your favorite podcast platform and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would greatly appreciate it. And this is going to be a quick episode because... Uh, I was traveling over the weekend, uh, went to Denver, Colorado for a couple of days, flew back late last night, woke up this morning and had to drive back to Columbus from Cincinnati, and uh, we had actually already recorded probably a good 40-something minutes worth, but your pal here running the recording uh, forgot to hit the record button. So uh, this is going to be short because we basically were almost done when I had figured it out that we weren't recording. And we still like to put out an episode for you listeners, so this is what we're going to have for you. But Frank's going to kick it off talking about the DNC that's going on this week. All right, that's right. The DNC is just getting started. Um, There seems to be a lot of activity with the DNC that we didn't exactly see at the RNC while we were there. Um, The protesters are supposed to number, by some accounts, in the thousands something that we didn't really notice when we were at the RNC there. Yeah, um, I would say while we were at the RNC, the protests were quite underwhelming for what I was expecting. Yes, but, you know, tonight as Biden is supposed to speak, there are tons, uh, uh, supposedly thousands, of these both pro and anti Israeli protesters. You, you know what I mean about this. Yeah. Some of them are almost openly pro Hamas, which right. I can't believe. But um, it really highlights the split in the Democratic Party right now, where mm-hmm. they don't really see eye to eye on this issue. And there's a big question of where to go going forward. You know, they're right. pressing again for a ceasefire, and uh, there's been another round of attacks and it just seems like this is never going to end and the democratic party itself is almost splitting in two over right. the issue now because one of the i've seen a clip or heard a part of a clip earlier that i guess is one of the protest leaders talking about how they're not going to give a pass to any of the like democrat heads like nancy pelosi joe biden chuck schumer they're calling out all of the big names in the party so it definitely does really seem like there's a split between the party, especially when you compare it to um, the Republican Party right now. Because at the RNC, you know, a decent number of the protesters were would not call themselves Republicans, while uh, like the protesters at the DNC most likely would call themselves uh, Democrats. So it's it's interesting to see how there's protest within the party against itself. Exactly. Almost yeah. like it's fracturing. Or, right, yeah. Uh, something of that sort, falling apart. <clears throat> well, and it's interesting, too, that all of this comes on the backdrop of Biden's ouster, mm-hmm. you know? And he's supposed to be one of the keynote speakers. Uh, I believe he was supposed to go on tonight, but he hadn't um, spoken before we started recording. Um, but you know, there's all these stories coming out that behind closed doors that he is, the reports say pissed, Mm -hmm. all right, pissed at certain people like Pelosi and Obama because of his ouster. And remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago that this was supposed to be his, um, convention, right? you know, he was supposed to be the nominee. Yeah. So... This is really a big shakeup that we've seen in the DNC. And in in a way, it's kind of a shame that you and I couldn't just drop everything we were doing in our lives and go and be there. Um, But I will take this as a moment to say that if you didn't get to check out our Republican National Convention reporting and some of the video that we took there, uh, you should definitely check that out because it is quite a dichotomy that we're seeing with the RNC where there's, you know, thousands of protesters. Right, yeah. So <clears throat> anyway, that's all I really had on the R- uh, the DNC. Like I said, it is 
just sort of warming up, so I'm sure we'll talk about it again. Yeah, uh, probably in our next episode, once it's all said and done, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's been quite a crazy election year, one of the craziest that I've been a part of. Uh, almost well, an attempted assassination on former president running currently, and the ticket change with the Democrats, it's certainly been wild. Yes, it has. Least. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, some of Kamala Harris's economic proposals that she's put out in the past few days or a week or something like that. Uh, and the one that's been getting the most talk is about um, price gouging. And I guess she wants to find a way to prevent price gouging, I guess with price controls, which is essentially what it would be. Well, it's more like to deflect from the inflation that she and Biden have created. Yeah. Right, yep, that, that too, because uh, they've tried to make corporations the scapegoats for the higher prices before. We talk about how they you know, they need to lower their cost. Like, they need to lower their cost, like, as if it doesn't cost them something to, to operate. Um, but... I, uh, it's certainly really isn't going to work to control the prices, at least in my opinion, and certainly in some some eco economists' opinion. Because uh, it's really hard, not really hard, but it can be hard to r determine what, what is a price gouge. Like, how do you evaluate what would be too high of a price for a particular good or a service? At any given time. Yeah. Um, in any given market, right? It's it's because usually, I mean, especially if there's more than one provider, if you will, like they're always competing. That's like one of the big things about capitalism is the competition of it all. And if you have store A trying to mark up something by twenty something percent more than what it normally be. Well, store B is probably likely to only do it, if they're going to mark it up, probably like 15 or maybe even 18, just under the 20% from the other store. So they could bring in the business, take the business away from store A. So it's, I don't want to say always, but in most cases, there's going to be another provider to offer a lower cost to undercut the people that are supposedly gouging the prices. And... Price controls in themselves don't work. Uh, rent control is a thing that happens in our country already, and it does not lower the cost of housing. I mean, it might artificially lower that cost for some people, but it pushes the cost for others onto them and higher higher rents in certain places mm -hmm. and um, you know other higher costs related to housing. And we see it um, in Venezuela. Venezuela has huge oil deposits, and they have price controls on their oil market. And they, uh, you know, their their economy is certainly not singing along at all. And I'm sure it's not just the price controls on their oil. I mean, they got more problems than that. But for all of the oil that they have. They control that market so tightly, but yet they, their country is still in a huge hole, terribly. Um, so price controls don't really work, and if this somehow gets passed, if Kamala Harris is in the office, it's certainly going to hurt the economy worse than it already is, and it's going to hurt people's pocketbooks more than it already is. And... Um, it's a terrible idea, and hopefully people will see that as it gets talked about more. Well, and I would just point out, if I may, to be sure. a little loose here, but these people are not capitalists that we're talking about. And it's right. things like this that show it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a communist, and the comparison to Venezuela is very apt right. because that's we're walking the same path as Venezuela mm -hmm. in many ways. We're putting... If we put somebody like Kamala Harris in power, you know, we're basically doing the song and the dance 
of these South American countries. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> We're going the same way, yeah. doing the same thing, putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Right. <clears throat> yep. The idea that somebody as corrupt as her could go after price gouging. <laughs> right. Right. Well, another thing she's proposed is a $25,000 credit to first-time home buyers, and I believe it's even an additional qualifier of first-generation home buyers, uh, which to my understanding would mean like your parents before you didn't own a house. Um, and that's certainly not a very good idea either because but programs like these are certainly ripe for uh, abuse because uh, even when the government was giving out money for the COVID stuff, there is huge reports of companies abusing the loans to keep paying their employees and stuff like that. So I can't imagine how, well, I mean, I'm sure it could be easily abused uh, just like any other government program. And it's, just like any other program where it involves money, that money comes from the taxpayers, so it's sort of like a, a wealth wealth transfer. Sure, yeah. We're going to be essentially giving $25,000 to people who don't already have $25,000. In a manner of speaking, yes. Yeah, you know, to go buy a house that they may or may not be able to afford. Um, so it... And I'm even somebody who the Democrats would probably like to target for this program because I'm trying to save up to buy a house. Um, My parents never owned a house, and I don't currently own a house. So it sounds like I check their boxes, but I'm not interested in anything like this because generally government programs that involve money also involve strings attached to them in one way or another. And... uh, I'm not up for that. And hopefully most people won't be either, although everybody loves free money. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, just to pick up there um, for my side of the argument, I wouldn't be surprised if this was just a gimmick. Sure. This was just something that she's saying. All talk, hot air. Sure. Campaign promises that maybe you never get lived up to mm-hmm. because... Um, I wouldn't be surprised, as you know from the last time we tried to record this, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if she meant something like first generation, like you have to be an immigrant, you know? Right. So I don't know. I guess neither of us are well read enough on this to answer the question. We should look into it a little more, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some trick right there in the whole first generation thing. and. How do they measure that? What right. if my parents didn't, but my grandparents did, or my great great grandparents are, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> what are they calling first generation? And that's why I wouldn't be surprised if they literally meant first generation in the sense that you're sort of fresh off the boat. Your parents weren't born here. Right. You're first generation. Yeah. So, I mean, that would make sense to me too. Yeah, but I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised because they probably want to, you know, slim down the number of eligible candidates, too, that they're going to have to give away this money to. And it's something that could sound nice where, like, maybe it sounds nice to you, but you're not even who they're talking to. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was just a fake campaign promise and they couldn't even get this passed through Congress anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I I can imagine, especially if— the Republicans keep the house. I I don't really see that going anywhere. Mm-mm. But, you know, it's just one of those big government proposals that the Democrats like to talk about. And I'm sure some people could probably give me examples of Republicans doing similar things, and I would say, yeah, that's uh, not very cool. Too. Well, bad policy is bad policy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good way to put it. So does that take me on to the last thing? Sure. Um. Okay. Because I was just going to pick up there and say that I was a paid income tax return preparer before for about five years or so. Uh, I've mentioned it before. Um, And I will just point out that there used to be a first-time homebuyer credit 
on your tax return that you could take. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure they discontinued that because it was a nightmare. It was a total nightmare. Oh, okay. It was a credit that you would take like once, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had to pay it back for like the rest of your friggin' life. And I'm huh. kind of being facetious, but right. not really. Because even if you ended up selling that home, moving out of that home, your home was already dealt with, done with. Right. You'd already moved on. Maybe you'd gotten remarried, had six kids. Mm -hmm. I still had people that I dealt with who were still paying off this first time home buyer credit when they're on home number six and life number four. <laughs> you know what I'm, I'm kind of mm. kidding a little bit, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the tax credit long outlived. I mean, you were paying it back and paying it back and it affected your tax situation mm. for years. Yeah. Even after you sold the home and the home was kaput, right. the home burned down the home, whatever, right. you know, you still have to wrestle with this tax credit the rest of your life. Right. Well, I'll also use that as a stepping stool to go on to the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which was I've kind of had a change of heart on these no tax on tips, this no tax on tips policy, mm -hmm. right? Because both sides seem to have come to some kind of agreement. I mean, not openly, publicly, right. but they both are singing the same song about this no tax on tips. Mm -hmm. And I sort of had the idea that... You know, forgiving all the other matters that are going to have to be worked out, all the kinks, you know, in this system. I started thinking, well, if this is going to be totally tax free income to the person I'm tipping. And I'm going to be paying the tax on the money. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that I might just start. And here's the other caveat, too, is remember, I have to go out of my way to always keep cash on me right. so I can give a cash tip. So I sort of had the epiphany that I might just start giving 10% instead of the traditional 20. Right. Because I'm thinking this is tax-free money to them. You know, right. I'm paying the tax on the money. So why not tip out a little less? Right. And, you know, I sort of asked you on the last recording. I'll ask you again here. But don't you think you might do the same or certain people might do the same. I mean, yeah, I sort of think it's my prediction that there will probably be a trend in the market. If this passes, you right. know, if this really happens that you probably will see more cash tips and probably smaller right. cash tips. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense to me, especially, you know, if people understand how taxing works and, under, and you know, kind of get, what you're saying about how the tip you're giving them, you're, you're paying the income because that was the income you've gotten to give the tip for. You're paying the tax on that, the income tax on it, but the person getting the tip no longer will be. Right. So you know, why not tip them a little less? Because they get to keep every dollar, every penny of the dollar that you give them. Right. Instead of, you know, if you gave them a dollar, the government was going to take another 10% out of the dollar you gave them. So that one dollar <laughs> is being taxed twice already. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, all of our dollars are t double, triple, and yeah, quadruple true. taxed. But, but yeah, um, yeah, I can see that happening. People start tipping a little less, but maybe more frequently. Who knows? It might even out. I think it just follows and makes sense, mm -hmm. too. I mean, because... Like I said on the first go around, it's easier math to right. just do 10%. It's, you know, I've got to sort of make a deal. My part of the social contract is I've got to always carry cash around on me, right. which I'm not used to doing. And, you know, it's not like any portion of my income is tax free. Right. So it also sort of saves on the jealousy angle. I mean, right. I hate to put it in those kinds of terms, sure. but we're all human, yeah. you know, and the seven deadly sins are what they are. Yeah. And you might start to resent somebody you're tipping, right. you know, to think, well, this is just tax-free income to you. Yeah. But if I just shave a little off yeah, it's not and still bad. feel good about giving the tip, right. you yeah. see what I'm saying? I mean, right. I think it could really be good 
all around and in a manner in mm-hmm. in this small market, the tipping market, you right. might say, you'd see a little bit of deflation, I think. Right. Well, I wonder, because um, I've heard videos and stories of, of complaints about the current state of the tipping economy. Everybody's asking for a tip now everywhere you go. Yeah. And I kind of wonder, uh, would more people even try asking for tips, knowing that it's not going to be taxed? Because that would be interesting to see. Like, is, is McDonald's going to have a thing that says, you want to tip the sir, the person behind the counter? Or, you know, or places that you normally wouldn't expect there to be tips. Well, I understand. And we sort of brushed on this the last time we talked about the mm-hmm. no tax on tips issue. But, I mean, for me, as somebody who knows some of the tax code, I mean, I'm no expert. I'm not sure. a tax lawyer or anything like that. I'm not an enrolled agent with the IRS. But I have some experience. And I know, like I said before, I mean, even if you're if you find twenty dollars on the f- sidewalk, right? The IRS says they tax all worldwide income from whatever source derived, right? That's their lingo. So even twenty bucks you find on the sidewalk, you're supposed to report that as other income, just like normal income. Mm-hmm. It's taxed just like wages. It comes in 20 bucks right on top of everything else you made that year. Yeah. Extra 20. Well, what if I find 20 bucks on the sidewalk and say, oh, it's a tip. Right. See? I yeah. mean, there there's going to be some issues because yeah. traditional IRS says, oh, boy, that's 20 taxable dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it definitely seems like it can get hairy and stuff will have to be worked out. Well, and I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, what if you have people who work from home and deal with their clients in, who knows, some contractual capacity, and they start moving certain funds and saying, oh, you know, this service fee is now going to be a tip. Mm, Yeah. You see, I mean, you could play some games with this. Yeah, definitely. And well, in our first uh, attempt to record, um, we talked about how it, Maybe it could affect how uh, businesses restructure their employees. Maybe employees currently who aren't tip-based are moved to tip-based. Right. Uh, Which we also talked about the first time. Right. We did. We brought up this subject, yeah. too. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw that, too. More people right. moved into tipping positions, mm-hmm. which I don't think would necessarily be good. Because I think big picture, and if you see a big shift of people who make $40,000 a year down to making $19,000 a year, you see what I'm saying? Right. Even if there are other incomes tax-free, you're still... We're talking about deflation here. Right. There's a reason that word's on my mind, and I keep wanting to bring it into this segment, because it is going to be a certain... It's going to cause a certain kind of deflation, I promise you. And I think deflation in a certain market, if we're just talking about tips just tipping culture, tipping mm-hmm. period, I think that could be good because then you could still go out and buy $120 worth of food and only leave a $12 tip. Right. But you see, when you want to tax it at a higher rate, now I have to leave a $24 tip. Well, that's two appetizers. Right. Why do I want to buy my waiter two appetizers? You know? like. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I think it will definitely... Have quite an effect that um, will be interesting to see how it plays out, especially if both parties are trying to push this idea. It seems pretty likely that it could happen. I haven't really heard any House Republicans or, or Democrats, I guess, come out saying, no, 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 we we won't pass this in any, any way. Uh, so it seems like it could happen. It would be interesting to find out what the effects of them are. Well, and I sort of like the idea, I mean, maybe we'll have to bring this up again or in a different context or something, but I would just say this. My mind is fascinated by, this is the closest thing I've seen to something like deflation in a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think this could have an effect. Now, whether it'd be good or not, I'm not an economist. Right. But I like the idea of deflation. Yeah. 
Well, uh, is that all you got for the taxel and tips? That is, that's all I got. All right, well, the last quick story here, it's not going to be very long, is this whole uh, hubbub about Tim Walls' uh, service in the military and how people are saying he's stolen valor and he's claiming to have served in the war zone when he wasn't. He was claimed to be in a different rank than he was. Right. And when all this first started coming out, I didn't really know what to think about it. But then uh, I started to kind of have an idea of where I, where I thought. And then one of my favorite commentators, Andrew Clavin, basically said kind of what I was trying to think in my own head. Was that um, I didn't serve. And the only thing I feel like I can really say about it is if indeed he's misled his military record that is certainly gross behavior uh not very good but uh i'm gonna leave all the criticisms about it to people who have served in the military um and it's not really going to be an issue that i would really consider as far as if i were to ever vote for the guy which of course i'm not but i just it's almost like one of those things that's neither here nor there for me, although, like I said, I, I still think it's a terrible thing to do if indeed he, which it does seem to be, that he has misrepresented his service in the military. Um, well, can I say a point yeah, on that? go for it. I also come from a military family. I've not served, but my grandfather, my uncle, my father before me, they all served. Um... And the stolen valor thing, you know, it is an interesting question, isn't right. it? I mean, sometimes I see these videos on the internet and my heart goes out to the people because they're obviously not veterans. And it's like they need some kind of attention or they have some kind of illness or they need help. It's like a cry for help sometimes, I think. Right. And you see them being berated by these real soldiers and you think, come on, guys. I mean, I get it that they're not military, but this person's obviously sick or whatever, you know? Yeah, right. But <clears throat> so I understand this can be a touchy subject. And sure. All. I get that. And I get having reverence for those who have served, mm -hmm. especially when we have not. Right. But I wouldn't go so far as you as to say that I'm just going to let other people talk for me because I've made that mistake before on the abortion issue when I was younger. I used to think, oh, I'm a male. I shouldn't even really have an opinion. And it took me a long time to figure out that that wasn't right and that right. it's fine for me to have an opinion. And I'll just tell you this. I've, I don't care too much for Tim Waltz and I don't know too much about Tim Waltz. I, I don't know too much. That's what I should have said. Not that I don't care too much, but I mean it in a sense that I'm not a democratic voter and I'm not sitting here trying to get to know the guy. I'm right. not, yeah. I'm not invested anyway. Sure. That's, that's what I mean by I don't care is like, I, you know, am not going to vote for him. Right. Yeah. So, but I have seen, I've seen it for myself. I can show you some of the clips and I think this would interest you and might unmute your silence, but if there's an element to this stolen valor, I've heard him on several occasions like politicians do in these big town hall meeting types uh -huh. of things where he's he'll say to people, <clears throat> I'll make sure, like it's a promise, these false campaign promises. Right. Talk about it again. I'll make sure that nobody carries a weapon of war like I did. Right. Yeah, I've heard that. Unless it's in the war field like I was. Or whatever. And you know he's talking about guns in school or guns in whatever. He's trying to do this anti gun he's a he's a huge left winger, you know oh, that, right? Yeah. He's he's on this anti gun stuff. Yeah. And that's what bothers me. Is he wants okay, it's one thing to lie, right? Because I think, yes, like you're saying, I think you'll get caught in it. You'll be caught up by other veterans. It'll speak for itself. Your military record, whatever. It'll come to light. But there are a bunch of people who don't care for facts. And if they listen to somebody like him and want to hear him say, I carried weapons in war and nobody else should be able to carry weapons of war, that's crazy, you know? Because the the AR-15 is not a weapon of war. 
That's what they're going after in most cases, yeah. right? He's lying. He's a friggin' liar. I mean, I don't know that I shouldn't. I'm not a, you know, you know. But it sure smells that way. I'll say yeah. that. And for him to use a lie to change hearts, I think is really wrong. Right. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of what I said earlier. I think if if it is all true, and which it does seem to be that he's misrepresenting his service in the military, military I do think it's bad and terrible behavior. I don't like it. But as far as really trying to call him out on it and, you know, trying to almost, what it seems to me, is diminish his time in the military, That's I don't feel like that's my place to do. But well, kind of like I what would, you're saying, lying about it to help push an agenda. That's uh, yeah, I don't, I don't like that at all. Certainly, that's the only thing. Is like right. if you're just gonna lie, okay, lie. I served in the like if I just said to you, Reed, I served for four years in Kuwait. Okay. Yep. Now you know me. <laughs> None of that makes any sense or anything. Right. But if I just said that, I mean, he, he, that in and of itself just is what it is. Sure. Doesn't make sense. It's just a lie. It's people say it. People are crazy. People do drugs. People yeah. who knows what people think or what pe- what's going on in people's heads. To lie is one thing. But then to do it over and over and over to push anti second amendment legislation. Right. Mm, we've really crossed the Rubicon, yeah. I think. Right. Well, uh, I guess to me that kind of um I would almost, in a way, separate the two. I mean, they're bas- they are linked, him lying about his service to push an agenda. Yes, but see, this I get where you draw the line. Sure. I want you to get where I'm drawing the line. I do. I totally I'm, do. But see, my point is I don't care to repeat lies if they are lies. Yeah. Because if it got people to think twice, I'm willing to sp- talk crap about Tim Walls. I mean, I don't even know him, but right. I would because I want people to think twice. I don't want some gun crazy, you know, like take your guns, right. anti-gun crazy. That's how I should put it, I guess. Some anti-gun crazy person getting in there. Right. So I'll repeat a lie. I, I mean, I don't know, but I'm willing to believe that he, you know, did lie. He is a liar. Yeah, I'm willing to believe that. Oh, I am too. He's running with Kamala. For oh, right. sakes. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my main point was just more to his actual service in the mil- military, not necessarily. When I get, I get sort of the self criticism that maybe you don't have a leg to stand on. Is yeah. that what you mean? I mean, I sort of get that, and maybe I don't either. But right. I will. He's putting himself out there. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. I like Andrew Clavin. I'm not trying to go against him or what you're saying, but in this case, I just don't really see that because I think you should call a lie a lie, at least to get people to think, you know, if it's all just military, okay, I guess we're going to lose, but right. I think it's a little more than just that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I get that too. Um, because I said earlier, like, uh, you know, if if it was more, like, well, I guess since it is more about, like, um, he's using his service to push the agenda, I'd yeah. certainly criticize him on that. I was just speaking more towards people that are mostly just trying to call him out for his misrepresentation of the service. And now that was a huge story for, you know, a week. And that's... Well, what I'll everybody say, was talking about about him was how he's misled his. Some of the service. people, the majority of the people that I've seen speak on that have been military people. Right. Sure. So I just hope people would self censor. You know, I'm not sitting here saying I know for a fact that he quit, he retired early so that he wouldn't have right. to go to war, and then he still lied about it. No, because I don't have that kind of knowledge. Right. But. I'm telling you what I feel and what I think, and yeah. I think he's a big fat phony. Oh, I do too. He's <clears throat> yeah, big fat phony. He's a liar. 
He uh, he has an agenda. He tries to come off more moderate than he is, but if you look at the stuff he's supported in his state, it's not moderate at all. Hard left. Yeah. Um, but that is all I really had about uh, Tim Walls. Uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting story for a bit. and I think it's also interesting. I will just say this. I know we need to wrap up here, but... I think it's interesting how this story, no matter what side you're on or who you are, the Tim Waltz story really touches almost everybody in America, right. you know, because it does ask that question. What does it mean to serve? And are we proud of our vets? And what mm-hmm. does it mean to be a vet? And, right. you know, it sort of asks some deep questions, this Tim Waltz thing. Yeah, sure it does. It sort of affects everybody. Yep. Uh, I mean, a lot of people know at least one person who's served in the military. So I'm um, sure they can relate in some manner to it. But uh, I think that is all I had for that. You got anything else before we finish up? No, sir. All right. Well, listeners, we hope you enjoyed this brief conservative conversation, and we hope you follow us on your favorite podcast platform. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and many more. And we also hope you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search at Conservative Conversations 92. And we would appreciate it if you go check out Red Circle and become a paid subscriber to access exclusive content for our show. We hope you might share us with a friend or two and encourage them to become paid subscribers so that they have the same access to all of the bonus material and extra recordings that you have access to. And as always, we thank you for listening.